Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series of lessons is a very significant one on the Book of Romans. This is lesson number six in that series for November 11 of 2017, entitled Adam and Jesus. What do you suppose that would include? Well, this lesson is focus, will focus not exclusively, but we will focus on Romans 5. So that will be our study today, primarily. I hope you have your Bible handy with you, but let's begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, as we work our way through this incredible book, the book of Romans, we come now to chapter 5. May we understand what you are trying to say to us through your friend Paul. Some of it's a little difficult language, but we think that we can, we can put it together and see it in the larger context. May that be our experience today as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. It's very important to notice when you begin Romans 5 in one of the more traditional translations, the very first word is, therefore. So Paul is assuming that we have correctly understood Romans 1 through 4 before we proceed to look at Romans 5. So let's just briefly review. In Romans 1, Paul discussed the condition of the pagans of Rome before they came to Christ. Would you ever trust such a person? Then in Romans 2, he discussed the Jews who were critical of the Gentiles who had become Christians. They felt themselves so superior and they were so judgmental. God declared that they were just as guilty as and may perhaps more than the formerly heathen Romans. Then in Romans 3 through 8, now we're in the middle of that process, we will discover that God explained how he sets us right and if we are willing to listen and trust him. We find that both the Gentiles and the Jews were worshiping false gods. Each group had created their own god and are we worshiping a false god today? What is or who is our God? And then I picked up these two statements from Ellen White that are pretty shocking. No outward shines, shrines may be visible. There may be no image for the eye to rest upon, yet we may be practicing idolatry. It is as easy to make an idol of cherished ideas or objects as to fashion gods of wood or stone. Thousands have a false conception of God and his attributes. They are as verily serving a false God as were the servants of Baal. So, are we worshiping the true God as he is revealed in his word, in Christ, in nature? Or are we adoring some philosophical idol as enshrined in his place? Testimonies, Volume 5, 173 and 174. Wow. Does she answer it? Well, here's another statement, more or less the same. See if this helps to answer it. No outward shrine may be visible. There may be no image for the eye to rest upon, yet thousands are following after the gods of this world, after riches, fame, pleasure, and the pleasing fables that permit man to follow the inclinations of the unregenerate heart. So there are some potential idols, okay? Multitude, multitudes have a wrong conception of God and his attributes, and are as truly serving a false god as were the worshippers of Baal. So she says it again. Many, even of those who claim to be Christians, have allied themselves with influences that are unalterably opposed to God and his truth. Thus they are led to turn away from the divine and to exalt the human. Okay, there are two versions of that statement. What do we learn from those two statements? She didn't answer it. Well, we're prone to exalt the human to look at things as if they were there was a natural explanation for everything, and uh, including salvation. Uh, and uh, but we must be born again. There has to be a, a divine, supernatural element in in terms of salvation. And uh, if we're looking for just natural means, then we're missing out. Yeah, but she's not really talking about natural as far as these other people go. They, they actually have a faith, don't they? And, and it's like but worshiping an idol. They're exalting the human. 
So by human, I'm talking about the the natural stuff that we experience well, and do. So the ultimate question for us is, how can we develop a correct, true picture of God? By beholding. Yeah, but if I people never see, had never seen God. He's invisible. I don't know anybody at this root table has seen God. But it's Jesus invisible. is visible. But Jesus became visible. I've never seen him. Yeah. But you see him in his word if you allow the spirit to guide you. It's interesting that uh, Isaiah takes this challenge on. Between chapters 40 and 55, he says, okay, how do you determine who is the true God? And he, he basically ends up saying three things, but mainly two. He says, the original, the one true God created everything. If your stone God can't create anything, is not a real God. Okay? And create out of nothing. Create it out of nothing. Secondly, he says the real God can predict the future far in advance. Okay, let's hear your, I'm listening. Do I hear your stone God <laughs> prophesying something years in advance? I mean, he just really makes fun of people who make, you know, and, and I think right, uh, this is not just trying to put people down. He's saying what you're doing is completely and totally foolish. So that's not the right way. I mean, the, you know, this woods, uh, idols out of stone and wood and metal or whatever. So what are the right ways? We can, we, he, she, may, he may, she makes, I mean, he makes it pretty clear. Isaiah makes it pretty clear where you need to start. If your God can't predict the future far in advance and if he was not the creator of the universe, then you're, you're on the wrong track to start out with. So when Ellen White makes that statement, those statements, mm -hmm. if you give those two tests, you won't ever be what she said. Okay, what she's saying, what, if you put Isaiah and, and Ellen White together, they're saying you have to start with at least those two things. If you don't start with those two things, you, you, there's no way you can come out. So if you're starting with oh, this, so you have to start. Yeah, but still, you're not there yet. Well, no, because you can you can make you can make almost anything into a god. And the third the third thing. The third thing is actually being able to predict the future. Or you even, we got you, that was well, even temporarily. It's, mir it's miracles. Miracles. Yeah, miracles. Yeah, the third thing is yeah, miracles. I yeah. I I'm sorry. My yeah. yeah, but wasn't she covering people like that, and they can still be. Yeah. Still be idolatrous? Okay, so could we, as Seventh-day Adventist Christians, could we be worshiping a false god? Could she, we? Yes. She I think she I can hear riches and various and many times. Yeah. <laughs> so how do we avoid that? I'll, st I'll stick by you then if you know how to pick them out. Well, it's, it's pretty how do we avoid that? TV on. We seek to do the will of God. We seek him and his uh, to grow in faith and, and put away all those things that uh, minimize our, our okay. faith in him. Let's be honest. I, I think we really need to get down to where the rubber meets the road. So if we are honest, each one of us will have to recognize that the God we worship is in fact a mental construct that we have put together from our previous life experiences. Now hopefully Though that mental construct is based on solid evidence from Scripture, and we would we would say also from Ellen White, but we 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 still, I mean, what we have to worship is what we have put together. We can't worship something that we we have we, that's not in our brain yet. We can only worship something that's already in our brain. So, what can we say about the God we worship in light of that? Is he loving and kind and gentle and all those good things? Or does our God, does our picture of God, even what we say about God, ever appear to be in any way arbitrary, exacting, vengeful, unforgiving, severe? Tyrannical, despotic. And lots of other things that Ellen White mentions. Well, here's what she says in volume five of the testimonies. 
from the beginning, it has been Satan's studied plan to cause men to forget God, that he might secure them to himself. Hence, he has sought to misrepresent the character of God. So what, he rec what does he recognize? He's recognizing that if, if you have a clear and correct picture of God, he has no choice. He, he has no, no, no place to get in there. So the only way he can make an inroads into our lives is by misrepresenting the character of God. To lead men to cherish a false conception of him. The Creator has been presented to their minds as clothed with the attributes of the Prince of Evil himself as arbitrary, severe, unforgiving, that he might be feared, shunned, and even hated by men. Think that's ever happened. Satan hoped to, to so confuse the minds of those whom he had deceived that they would put God out of their knowledge. Then he would obligate the divine image in man and impress, obliterate, I'm sorry, then he would obliterate the divine image of, uh, in man and impress his own likeness upon the soul. He would imbue men with his own spirit and make them captive, captives according to his will. So that's certainly not what we want to do, right? So how do we make sure that our picture of God is correct? Well, it's a growing, it's not a, oh, now I've got it. You know, you, you, it's a growing thing if we, if we, uh, oh. and, and you remember Richard Neese, uh, the late Richard yeah. Neese, and one of the things he said that we should have an image, but not a graven image, because mm -hmm. if you have this, this is what it is, then you, you're wa worshiping a false idol. Yeah, if, if, you're, if your picture of God hasn't grown any in the last year, you're worshiping a graven image. So it, it's a living, growing, dynamic mm -hmm. uh, thing, and, and so there's well, submission to, to yeah. him. Let's ask a question about Paul himself. We know the story of Paul. He was persecuting Christians. He was sure that he was doing God's will. This was his God-given mission. He was on his way to Damascus, and bang, he was hit with a bolt of light. Maybe not lightning, but light. And, of course, we know what happened. What changed in Paul's life at that point? Did he change his Sabbath? No. No. Did he change his diet? No. Did he change his dress? I'm thinking about things we, we talk about in church from time to time. No, really, the only thing Paul changed was his picture of God. I think he changed to the picture of himself, too. Well, that, yeah. In, and in light of the... Exactly. You know. Exactly. That you change your picture of God, then it can have a massive impact on your picture of self. That's correct. So he, did, he didn't even change his Bible. No, he didn't. But he sure changed his understanding of his Bible. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So having reviewed now just briefly, what do you think? Do we believe that the Father, if he had come instead of the Son, would have exact acted exactly as his son did? In other words, basically we're saying, did Jesus fully and correctly represent the Father? Absolutely. Shall I quote, quote that for you? 14.9. 14, 14.9, he said that himself. Seen seen the Father. Ellen White expands on this. She <coughs> says, had God the Father come to our world and dwelt among us, humbling himself, veiling his glory, that humanity might look upon him, the history that we have of the life of Christ would not have been changed. In every act of Jesus, in every lesson of his instruction, we are to see and hear and recognize God. And that would include, you know, of course, the Father. In sight and hearing, in effect, it is the voice and movements of the Father. John 1, uh, 18 and 646, mm -hmm. nobody has seen the Father except for the one that came from the Father. And apparent, I would ex assume that the Father is not seen by any finite being ever. Mm -hmm. Because if nobody's ever seen him, it doesn't mean he's going to be, he only, if Jesus isn't enough for you, There's nothing the truth has be. gone past you. Well, you're, why, you're, 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 why do you think she, she even made that comment? Because there's a, there's a lot of people who believe that 
God is some kind of an awful judge up there that you don't dare approach. And so the only reason it's safe, the only possible way to be saved is you have saints pleading for you and you have Mary pleading for you and you have all these people and finally Jesus is pleading with the Father for you and maybe if you're lucky, all these people pleading for you will, will get you in. Well, isn't it also because some people think that the Old Testament God is different? Sure, than the, yeah, that's, that's the another one part of it, yeah. And then Jesus, so mm -hmm. that would clear it up right there. And that's mm -hmm. why she would say that. So, why is the Old Testament God come across to many people today as an arbitrary, angry, uh, self-centered, yeah. vengeful? And, and then you because have the people were different back then than they are today. Human nature is not all that no, much different. No, 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 no. There's you can't even compare the the philosophies and things that were going on back then. Most everybody. I mean, it was might makes right the whole way. Yeah, when you got might makes right, what is God supposed to do? Yeah, Be meek and mild? Have you, I don't know, I, I haven't, I seem to be a lot of people around who still think that might makes right. That's right. It's uh, Darwin. Is, uh, well, you get, and talking about the last century, what about Stalin and Hitler and didn't they think, you know? Yeah, but well, you didn't have a leader back there if he didn't feel like you know, mess around with this person, just take him out and kill him. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, you don't do that nowadays. Is, is, isn't that what God told him to do? do. Well, that's like what that. I'm saying, that back then, people were like that. God had to deal with them like that. Okay, so let's, let's come to the New Testament now. What does the death of Jesus teach us about God? Did that death in some way demonstrate God's own righteousness? Because that's, that's what Paul says. Romans 1, Romans 3, it demonstrated God's own righteousness. Yeah, but so, that's that word righteousness. Righteousness in what? Character. Well, it's, it's character, presumably. It could be a lot of things. But righteousness just means that it was right. Character is always a factor of love. Always. There's no such thing as good character without yeah. good love. Well, the death, <laughs> the death is almost saying that God will love you clear to death. And that you need to that's love others clear to death. Same way. Oh, yeah, he, <laughs> that's true, but, but he's leading the way. Yes, he's showing us the way. He is the way. Exactly. So let, let's, let's ask a specific question in light of what some people have understood. Was he telling us the truth when he said, way back in the Garden of Eden, sin leads to death? Yes. Genesis 2.17. Or was it primarily, like many people would say today, he died to pay the price for sin? Is there a difference? Was it on sale? There's a big difference. <laughs> big difference. Well, in Romans 4, as we're moving on, Paul turned to the quintessential example of faith for the Jewish people, Abraham. We talked about that last week. Although failing in several tests in his early years, as time went by, he showed himself to be God's wonderful friend, and he's called God's friend to, in several places of Scripture, Second Chronicles 27, 20, verse 7, Isaiah 41, verse 8, and then James 2, 23. He was even jealous for God's reputation. Shouldn't we be jealous for God's reputation? Are we correctly representing God, even to our children? So, coming back to our main chapter for today, Romans 1. Therefore, let us continue at peace with God, the New English Bible says. Uh, does that peace come through a legal transaction whereby the righteousness of God is imputed to us? Or does that peace come because we know God and we are beginning to understand all that He can do and has done for us? Well, the latter. We can come, as I said before, maybe it was in the last lesson, that we can come boldly before the throne of grace uh, so we have access to him. Things have changed, uh, okay. but it's not just a, a legal right. It's a, it's there's a what what organic. There's history. a big argument there because the the word there about we have peace. Well, let's it, go on having peace. Isn't it it can be translated we have peace, or it can be translated let us have peace, depending on a very subtle difference in the word. Mm -hmm. So 
This translation I've quoted here says, let us continue at peace. I prefer that, and here's why. What kind of peace is it that, um, that comes with living new life in Christ in Romans 5 and 6? Notice, very importantly, it's, it's peace with God. It certainly is not peace with the world and certainly not peace with the devil. When we choose to follow God, we are declaring ourselves to be on God's side in the great controversy, and Satan is alerted to action. I mean, what, what would happen to Satan if a whole lot of people all of a sudden really did this and became God's faithful, stalwart, upstanding citizens? It would be curtains for Satan. It would be all over for him. Then we will be, so we're, we're, we're declare, when we declare ourselves to be at peace with God, we're declaring ourselves to be at war with the devil, right? To be his enemies. So if a sufficient number of us truly became Christians in this sense, in the fullest sense of the word, Satan's days are numbered. It's, it's, it's this a life and death issue for him. Let's be clear about that. We're not talking about, well, if you, if you become a Christian, then everything's going to be, you know, peaches and roses. It's not going to be true. Not, not in this world. So, how did sin come into our world? And now we're going to get into the, the main part of the book of, of Romans 5. So, how did sin come into our world? Well, God sin was in, in the universe before it ended up yeah. on, on this blue ball. Agreed. We on. Yeah, but how did it come to this particular world right, for right now? That's our to, question. To the other uh, human race. Yeah. Be, to the sin of Adam and Eve, right? Adam. To distrusting God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They, um, they trusted a false concept of God. Remember what the servant says to Eve? Well, you'll be like God, mm -hmm. knowing good and evil. She thought, well, that's a pretty neat <coughs> idea. Mm hmm. And the rest is history. Yeah. So many scholars, many Christian theologians have talked about that as resulting in what is called, known as original sin. What's original sin? I'm not clear what the Catholic Church means by it, but I think of it as being, uh, we, we've been cut off from God. We, we no longer have that vital connection, and consequently we <coughs> have no yeah. choice but to follow our own inclinations. Many, many Christians following the basic Catholic idea and theologians teach that somehow or other sin is inherited. So when Adam and Eve sinned, all of us become sinners. And they want to baptize that infant as soon as it's yeah. born, if possible, right? so that uh, if the thing uh, the child or the fetus dies then uh, they go and, and they would bliss. teach very specifically unless you're baptized as a Roman Catholic you cannot be saved yep now uh, I can tell you that we have a division in our family I was never baptized as a Roman Catholic baptized as Seventh-day Adventist but my wife <laughs> interesting enough she and her five siblings were all delivered when they were born by an Adventist doctor, but they had a Catholic nurse that was working with the Adventist doctor in this public hospital. So she made sure that every baby that was born under her watch got baptized as a Roman Catholic. So I guess my wife has a better chance to make it than I do. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Both no. ways. <laughs> well, she's she, covered, right? <laughs> she, she probably does, but not for that reason. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, is there going to be any problem with that happening to your wife? <laughs> Come on. No. I don't think so. I don't think so either. Mm. So let them do it. Okay. Yeah, I, I think she had the best intentions, and so yeah. God bless her. So now let's talk about this. What does it mean to be justified by his blood? That's the next question. The majority of Christians in our day who take Romans 5 seriously believe that God performs, and we talked about this last week, a legal exchange. They believe that the sins that we have committed are legally transferred to Jesus, and his righteousness is legally transferred to us. God then considers us righteous. Is such an exchange, tru exchange truly legal? Is it even possible to transfer sins? No. How does, I mean, can you make Jesus guilty? No. 
how does God get us to trust him again? Do the troubles, the endurance, and the character that are spoken of in Romans 5, 2 to 5, sound like something that is imputed? Or are these real experiences? Well, what does it mean to be justified by his blood? I think we have to be careful how we read this by his blood mm -hmm. statement because Paul repeatedly talks about the message of the cross, mm -hmm. which means that he's talking about the message of the blood. And what is the message of the blood? I think once again we can say it's better to bleed loving <laughs> than to fight. Yeah. And that's what Jesus did all the way to his death. To him, love was more important than life. And that's, in a nutshell, what the gospel is all about. So if, if that's true, that means all the sinners should be able to live forever and just cause all the good people to bleed forever. Because that's... I think it, no. what we are saying is that we follow the advice of Christ. It says, if they hit you on the right cheek, let them do it on the left. Don't fight evil. It's not going to do any good. The only way to fight evil is to be evil yourself. So why do it? And what is what evil? Is Lack of love. That? What's going to stop that? Huh? Love is the only thing that will okay, stop okay. it. Okay, okay. Which I means I to be like that. Can, but you're going to sit here and give them the cheek your left cheek, your right cheek, for the rest of eternity. So how is it that these people are going to be kicked out somehow without it being I think we misunderstand the character of God. God, God is our places, says it's our protector. Though I go through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Uh, First Peter 5, 8, uh, the devil goes around, around like a roaring lion. Ephesians 6, 12, we wrestle not. All those things, uh, but I think the, Psalms 23, uh, I think we misunderstand the power that God has and what he wants to do. And so we die in the process. Uh, it's not a big deal. Dying is, is not all that big a deal. Well, here, here's, here's huh? the word. When is it? At any time. At any time? Even the uh, a little time. over a year ago, I was there, so, you know. I, uh, Are you talking about the second death, too? No. 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 It, well, it, you we, said any time, so I was... No, it, was that's, that's, sure. that's, that's uh, apples and oranges. No, Sometimes okay. when the question is raised, why did Jesus have to die? The answer is given because without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. Hebrews 9.22. You might ask, well, why would that be necessary? And, and people do sometimes ask that. What would that mean? The reply sometimes comes, well, that's what the Bible says. I mean, that's the way God said it had to be. If that's what he requires, then it's all right with him. Why do I need to understand? I just want to know that it's all right with him that he forgives us. What he had to, what he had to do to feel all right about it is no business of mine. That's a very dangerous way to approach, just to accept someone else's statement, even if it is from the Bible, without asking for the meaning. That is what the ancient Jews did, and that is what the Pharisees did in Jesus' day. Ellen White says, merely to hear or to read the word is not enough. He who desires to be profited by the scriptures must meditate upon the truth that has been presented to him by earnest attention and prayerful thought he must learn the meaning of the words of truth and drink deep of the spirit of the holy oracles. God bids us to fill the mind with great thoughts, pure thoughts. He desires us to meditate upon his love and mercy, to study his wonderful work and the great plan of redemption. Then clearer and still clearer <coughs> will be our perception of truth, higher, holier, our desire for purity of heart and clearness of thought, the soul dwelling in the pure atmosphere of holy thought will be transformed by the communion with God through the study of scriptures. Christ's object lessons 59 and 60. Well, does that, how does that fit with what Paul says? Look at Romans 3, I'm sorry, Romans 5, 3 to, verses 3 to 5. We also boast of our troubles because we know that trouble produces endurance 
Endurance brings God's approval, and his approval creates hope. This hope does not disappoint us, for God has poured out his love into our hearts by means of the Holy Spirit, who is God's gift to us. Okay? So let's go back and look at that. Patience. The first thing is patience. The Greek word that is thus translated is, is hupomone, means steadfast endurance. It means literally, uh, yeah, fast endurance. It means putting your shoulder under a load and, and just making it move. This is the type of endurance that tribulation develops in the one who maintains faith and who does not lose sight of the hope he or she has in Christ, even amid the trials and suffering that can make life so miserable at times. And the second word, it's the key word, is the word experience. The Greek word thus translated, dakime, means literally the quality of being approved. Hence, character, or more specifically, approved character. The one who patiently endures trials can develop an approved character. And then three, hope. Endurance and approval naturally give, us, give rise to hope. The hope found in Jesus and the promise of salvation in him. As long as we cling to Jesus in faith, repentance and obedience, we have everything to hope for. That's from our Bible study guide for Sunday, November 5 of 2017. So, in what sense, you know, and I don't know if we need to read this, but when we were still helpless, Christ died for the wicked at the time that God chose. In what sense are we sinners because of what Adam and Eve did? Can we put the question as bluntly like that? Well, we're born separated from God. Okay, born and, separated from God. And uh, therefore, once we begin to choose, we choose our own selfish ways. Uh, we certainly aren't, aren't, we're inclined aren't, to. Yeah, we certainly aren't each born in the Garden of Eden, are we? No. We, no. we Adam and Eve sin eternal, or I shouldn't say eternally. On this world, it's barred all of us from, from having a, being a part of the, the Garden of Eden, taking the fruit of the Tree of Life. That became a, a null uh, hypothesis for us, and no chance of any of us uh, being there and taking, eating of the fruit of the Tree of Life. At least that much, uh, we know. Now, if we believe the words of Ellen White, she says the Garden of Eden was still there until the time of the flood, and then it was taken up. So it means that all those skeptics who laughed and made fun of Noah could walk over and see the Garden of Eden with the angel still guarding the way to the Tree of Life. That, it did, that sort of blows me away. And yet they still rejected Noah's yep. message, God's message through Noah. Well, does it, if you have a garden out there with these beings that are light around mm -hmm. it, and after a while do you start looking at it differently? I mean, if you saw it, mm -hmm. you would have a certain respect. Yeah. But what if you were living around it, and you, and sin grew? Do you think and everybody yet that place is still there? It seems like you would, you might start changing your. Well, let me ask you this question: Do you think anybody ever tried to get in there? Try to break through the fence. Well, <laughs> if there was a, if there was an angel there with a. With, with some sort of weapon sword. that, would, yeah. But could you go up to the angel and start talking to him? I don't think so. Why not? Well, unless they were like Buckingham Palace guards, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I don't know. We're speculating. Yeah. Yeah, I know, but we're putting it together. It's got to go together somehow, yeah. and it's kind of fantastic, whatever it is. Okay, they could rationalize. You know, if you if you don't want to believe something, you can come up with a rationalization. The more intelligent you are. So, in light of Romans five now, because we're, we're I keep watching the clock and it seems to be going faster and faster. In light of Romans five, is that original sin which Adam and Eve committed more serious for me, or is my sin more serious for me? Well, you bear your own guilt, so. Uh, you need a savior just as much as Adam and Eve needed a savior. Okay. So, so what's what's making all this bad karma on us? 
I mean, the fact that we no longer live in the Garden of Eden. I know, but um, what is the okay? Just that we're not there anymore. We don't is have that. that we don't have that. We don't have that relationship with God. I mean, remember Adam and Eve walked with God in the in in, in the cool of the evening. They walked with the angels in the cool of the evening. They could talk to them any time they wanted to. I. I so you're just saying that it's all transferring out to us because we can't go in there either. No, it's uh, in in a sense, it was transferred to us in the sense that we don't have the privilege of going back there even if we wanted to. Yeah, I can't go to the Garden of Eden even if I want to. No, but the spirit that Adam and Eve sure. had before they sinned, mm -hmm. the restoration of the image of God in us, which is how they were they were created. Yeah. That's the purpose of true salvation. Yeah. And that can only happen if we understand what God's mind was like. Mm -hmm. not, not that we understand all the science and all the philosophy and everything, yeah. but we need to understand that love. And that love is very simple. He expressed it all the way to the cross, all the way to the last drop of blood. And we were talking about uh, um, Hebrews a little while ago. There's no salvation or there's no purification or there's no healing of the sin problem without the shedding of blood. Christ showed the way, we must follow. And we have the answer to that question in chapter 12, verse 4, I believe, where he says, you have not yet attempted to fight sin, which means attempted to live love, mm -hmm. all the way to the shedding of your own blood, as Jesus did. Very good. Well, so the good news, of course, is that God did not wait for us to do anything. He took action. And because of his love, he sent his son, even while we were still sinners. And you know, that's one of the main points in Romans 5. He didn't wait to reach out to us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So in light of everything else we've studied, in light of Romans 4, and what he's going to conclude in a little while in Romans 5, somehow or other, his life and his death is supposed to make us friends of God. How does that work? We have to choose. It's not something that's going to ha happen to us mystically or s s uh, supernaturally. Supernaturally, it, it just uh, it, it's, it boils down to choice, and the choice cannot be uh, brought about through fear, intimidation, extortion, coercion. Yeah. and so forth. It has to be uh, respond to the spirit of truth. By studying the life and death of Jesus, we can learn the answers to the most important questions in the Great Controversy. Because that's, you know, that's God. Jesus came to reveal the truth about God. We could see who has been telling us the truth all along. Would you prefer to have a friend who always tells you the truth or one that lies? Do I need to even ask the question? Did you call that a friend? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, look at Romans 5, verse 9. That's a very famous verse. By his blood we are now put right with God. How much more then will we be saved by him from God's anger? By his blood we are saved from God's anger? How does that work? RSV uh, says wrath, and of course we identify, we learned that in Romans 1, what God's wrath is, is letting you go, letting you mm -hmm. live in your own self-centered way, so. Well, in light, yeah, go ahead. By blood. Yeah. Well, of course, Paul uses the term by his, the term for blood. Code he, word. It's, it's, it's a code word for his sacrificial death. Um, and so you need to ask yourself, okay, what does that mean to you? How, what's included in his sacrificial death? It's full of blood. blood. A, a, good, a good it's friend of mine. Life. He gave up everything about his life. In fact, we keep going to verse 10. For while we were enemies, we were for reconciled or brought, brought to God by death of his son, which, excuse me, much more now that we are reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Mm -hmm. It's life. Study his life is what, uh, and, and if you take the, his death out of the context of his life, you're going to get a distorted picture. Yeah. A good friend of mine, A. Graham Maxwell, wrote in a couple of places in a couple of his books, I Want to Be Free, in the book You Can Trust the Bible, 
God's wrath, as Paul seems to describe it, is simply his turning away and loving disappointment from those who do not want him anyway, thus leaving them to the inevitable consequences of their own rebellious choice. And so God's grace allows all of this to go on with the hope of people being mm -hmm. uh, being saved, making a choice to, to follow him. So in, in a sense then, we're, uh, we're, what was the text there? So we're saved from the wrath of God through Jesus. Mm -hmm. In other words, God doesn't just give us up and and let us all be consumed all right away. Okay, now you know how that's commonly understood. Hmm. It's commonly understood that if God were, if a father were left alone, he would say, you bunch of sinners, and he would just wipe us out. But Jesus pleads with him, and so he, and because he came down and lived and died, when he, when he was on the cross, God's, all of God's wrath is poured out on, on Jesus, and boy was God angry. And he just took care of everything right there. And now that he's got all his anger expressed, now he can now he can save the rest of us w without being angry at us. That's a distortion of the character of God. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, what he what he does is is he reaches out in grace to all of us instead of just turning and and leaving us to die. Okay, so if we accept the idea that by his blood, are we going to comment? Yeah, it all depends also what we mean by his grace. Wasn't his grace to give us the message that saves? Sure. It is the truth that will set you free. And oftentimes we jump to the conclusion his grace is forgiving sins. No, it's a whole lot more than that. The truth. It's the truth that mm -hmm. helps us to overcome sin. And, and Jesus' wor Jesus' words in, uh, what is it, John eighteen thirty seven. He, he, one of the few places where Jesus said what his mission was, and that is to bear witness to the truth or tell the truth. That's simple. That, that's succinct. And you don't need a big, big thick book. You, it helps. Well, it what helps. I'm trying to say is <laughs> yeah. you don't need to pontificate about a lot of things. Find out what the truth is, and that's why Jesus came here. Keep it simple. So, let's think about this. We don't, we don't buy that picture of God. So does... Does his death take the place of our death somehow? Does his life take the place of our life? No, Depends that's what death you're talking that's about. A sub, well, that's what we're talking about. Because uh, Jesus died, but uh, John the Baptist died, Paul died. Uh, with, with Lots of martyrs died. Yeah. So. Did we learn anything from the life and death of Christ about God and whether or not he has told us the truth about sin resulting in death? You know, well, back that's what we have in Romans 5.10, mm -hmm. well, which we're on top topic right now. Yeah. So Christ's life and death show that God told the truth and Satan lied about sin leading to death. Did Jesus die the death of the sinner? And how was God involved? Those are the questions. Um, Ellen White says these words, Christ on the cross, this is the, on the cross is, is the context, felt much as sinners will feel when the vials of God's wrath shall be poured out upon them. Black despair, like the pall of death, will gather about their guilty souls, and then they will realize, to the fullest extent, the sinfulness of sin. Salvation has been purchased for them by the suffering and death of the Son of God. Now that's a, a statement she made a long time ago, back in 1869. It's found in Volume 2 of the Testimonies. Let's try one more. Christ felt the woe that sinners will feel when they awake to realize the burden of their guilt, to know that they have forever separated themselves from the joy and peace of heaven. That's in a little book that most of many of us are not familiar with called The Story of Jesus. That was, that's her version of sort of the life of Christ written for children that I don't know if it's still published, but it was one time was very common. Well, come to one that's a lot more familiar, Desire of Ages. Satan, with his fierce temptations, wrung the heart of Jesus. The Savior could not see through the portals of the tomb. Now, what does that mean to you? He could not see through the portals of the tomb. Couldn't see God, his Father. Well, now, he had been communicating with God, as far as I understand it, every night through his life, at least through his adult life every night, planning his life, talking about what's going to happen next. 
So he apparent well, in fact, we know he, he knew what was coming, at least he had a general outline of what was coming, because he told his disciples a number of times, I'm going to go up to Jerusalem, I'm going to be handed over to the Gentiles, I'm going to die, and then I'm going to rise again on the third day. He said that, right? Mm -hmm. He just, in fact, it was clear enough to Judas that when he, t when he explained what was going to happen to the Pharisees, they said to Pilate, what did they say to Pilate? Give us a guard to make sure that he doesn't get out of that grave somehow in three days because this is what he said he was going to do. Okay? So, so, so then where does the portals that he couldn't see out of the tomb? That's the question. What, 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 what happened here to that vision that he clearly understood at one time? Was, it, was his stress so great that he had doubts? I don't know. I don't. The stress of Jesus had nothing to do with his physical suffering. Mm -hmm. It had everything to do with the fact that no one was accepting that message that could save humanity. At that point in time, no one, not even his disciples, had accepted it. Mm -hmm. Portals of tomb implies not only his own death, everybody's death. Mm -hmm. If we don't get his message, we are bound to all die. And that's the only hope we have is death. So Jesus is there thinking, how are they ever going to come out of this sin problem of theirs, being hung on a cross by these people? Yeah. So he's not thinking about himself. He's thinking no. about well, hold people. On. Yeah, yeah, that's what you're saying. Yeah, no, I agree with that. But let's, let's follow on with what Ellen White says. Hope did not present to him his coming forth from the grave a, a conqueror or tell him of the Father's acceptance of the sacrifice. He feared that sin was so offensive to God mm -hmm. that their separation was to be eternal. Yeah. Yes. Now that is serious. Now when we, if we believe Isaiah 59 verse 2, every time we commit sin, what are we doing? We're separating ourselves from God. Do we feel that same effect, that, that terrible fear that he had every time we separate ourselves from the Father? Well, Christ felt the anguish which the sinner will feel when mercy shall no longer plead for the guilty race. It was a sense of sin bringing the Father's wrath upon, man as his, upon him as man's substitute and made the cup he drank so bitter and broke the heart of the Son of God. Desire of Ages 753, paragraph 2. So what does that mean? Are we... As in his humanity, looking at the horribleness of sin, mm -hmm. he could not see how these people would ever get it. Mm -hmm. And he died because he was so sad that humans couldn't get the message, mm -hmm. uh, that's what killed him more than the physical pain. Yeah, it was, it was clearly the, yeah, it was not the physical pain. And Ellen White says that very clearly in the chapter, um, it is finished. Yeah. He, and yet he uh, told the thief on the cross that he would see him in paradise. So there was, there was a sense of faith as well, but it, so, but it, mm -hmm. it wasn't, it wasn't a clear what did Jesus say was the cause of his death? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Abandoned me. And what would cause such an abandonment? Did God ex did the Father actually abandon Jesus? Yeah. Of course. Well, no. Of course not. And that's very clear also from the writings of what he didn't. But did Jesus feel like he was abandoned? In his humanity, perhaps. Yeah, well, and, and that's what Ellen White says. And that's yeah. what, what died, was his humanity. So God's Spirit did, will not always be grieved. It will depart if grieved a little longer. After all has been done that God could do to save man, if they show by their lives that they slight Jesus' offered mercy, death will be their portion, and it will be dearly purchased. It will be a dreadful death. They will have to feel the agony that Christ felt upon the cross to purchase that for them the redemption which they have refused. And they will then realize what they have lost, eternal life, 
and the Immortal Inheritance, Testimonies for the Church, Volume 1, page 124. So, it's my understanding then that Jesus died. One of the things he accomplishes by dying is to prove the truth of God's statement back in the Garden of Eden that sin leads to death. Um, now, that could be discussed. I think um, it would be interesting to compare E.G. White with E.G. White because in the book Education she makes it very clear that redemption is education. So if you replace that word with the word education, Christ fell upon the cross to purchase for them the education which they had received. Mm -hmm. Now wouldn't that be interesting? Re uh, redemption is education. What education? Learning what love is. Learning from Him what love is because He's the only definition. He's the only expression of absolute love. And it's the only place where we can go to find out what it is. Yeah. And I would add to that, at least my understanding, I would add to that, the only experience we have seen, the only place we can look to to see what the consequences of sin are is on the cross that here is a demonstration of what happens to somebody when they're separated from God. Uh, we, the death, I mean, someone's killed on the freeway, someone is shot, someone dies of a heart attack, those aren't the consequences of sin. Those, those are the consequences, the general consequences of sin, but those aren't, those aren't the second death. So look at 1 Peter 2.21. It was to this that God called you, for Christ himself suffered for you and left you an example so that you would follow in his steps. Christ died for you. What does that mean? And if we're to follow his steps, do we follow his steps all the way through to torture? Well, Even to death? Is that... In the next chapter we'll talk more about his death and resurrection. Yeah. And, uh, but it, and it speaks of us being uh, dying with him, and if we die with him, we will also be raised with him. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you think of us, everybody being in him and in his death, we all, uh, he, he, he went through the portals of the, the tomb there, the, the second death, uh, with us and all of our uh, sinfulness also dies um, and we're raised with him uh, on the other side to newness of life. Okay, so here's the question the way I would put it. Have we been transformed from the old sinful condition in which we feared God and loved sin into the new covenant relation, covenant condition or promise condition, whatever you choose to call it, in which we fear sin and love God? Have we made that transition? Are we frightened that we might not be acceptable to God? How many things do we do, we do to try to make ourselves acceptable to God or to be saved? How many things do we do every day and every week that we believe are primarily to make us more acceptable to our friends and our fellow church members, even to God? We but, we are accept, but by faith we are accepted in the Beloved, so uh, we do those things just because that's the right thing to do, not because in order to, uh, uh, you don't, in other words, the, what the servant said was we're unprofitable slaves, or, or you don't owe us anything, we just did what, what we ought to have done mm -hmm. uh, in service. We don't have enough time to discuss it in, in detail, but Romans 5.12 says, Sin came into the world through one man, and his sin brought death with it. This is the key verse for, and you can go down to verse 18, it says more or less the same thing. The idea that we have original sin. As a result, death is spread to the whole human race. But it doesn't say because Adam sinned, it's because everyone has sinned. Mm -hmm. So is that the key to understanding these, this whole idea? There's a lot of collateral damage with evil, isn't it? Yep. It was God's original plan that we should live forever. But our sin has separated us from him and from the tree of life. Isaiah 59, verse 2. And now, as a result, all of us are dying. I is it because of Adam's sin or our own sin? Well, Mar both, in a, in yeah. a way. 
Martin Luther, trained as a lawyer, interpreted the Book of Romans as a legal explanation of the plan of salvation. Most theologians from his day to ours have followed his example. Theology has been filled with long Latin terms, which have been given very complicated legal meaning, propitiation and expiation and justification and sanctification, etc., are thought to be keys to salvation. But remember, salvation, also from a Latin word, is derived from the Greek word which is sozo, which means healing. So is our salvation based on a legal transaction, in which case it would not be truly healing, or is it truly healing? Well, healing. many Christians today regard justification almost as an entitlement to salvation. Is, is it true? It is true that God gives it as a gift, but we certainly do not deserve it. We are not entitled to it. Romans 5 has been the subject of an incredible variety of interpretations of understanding and it has been twisted for various theologians. I like this statement from the book by Dr. E.J. Wagner back in 1895. In beginning this study of the book of Romans, it will be an encouragement to the reader if he will remember that it is simply a letter written to the church in Rome. We cannot suppose that the congregation in Rome differed from the great body of Christians in general, and of them we read that not many wise uh, men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, 1 Corinthians 1, 26. The truest followers of Jesus have always been among the common people. So in the church in Rome, there were doubtless shopkeepers, artisans, day laborers, carpenters, gardeners, etc., and many servants in the families of wealthy citizens, together with a few who might have hold, held some position of rank. When we consider that it was confidently expected that people of this sort would understand the letter, we might be encouraged to believe that the same class of people can understand it now. Is that possible? Can we figure it out? While every Christian certainly prizes God's gift of salvation, Paul, impli Paul implied that for the serious Christian, there are also things for us to do. We do not have to, you do not have to have a PhD in theology in order to be saved. You can understand the book of Revelation by beholding Jesus, by learning to be learning of him and learning more about him, by learning to become his friend, you can be just that. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, what a privilege it is to have these words that raise questions in our mind and challenge us to think and and hopefully teach us more about you so that we can draw closer and closer and someday be completely transformed to become like you is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.